of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Mr. Alt? Here. Mr. Beistel? Here. Dr. Pike? Here. Mrs. Kaufman? Here. Mrs. Love? Here. Mr. Miller? Let the record show Mr. Miller's out of town today. Mr. Polakowski? Here. Mrs. Rhodes? Here. Mr. Mentz? Here. Citizens comment? No citizens comments this evening. At the uh, voting meeting, you'll be asked to uh, approve the uh, minutes of the reorganization meeting and the special meeting that was held on December 5th, 2011. Finance. Under finance, you'll be asked to approve the treasurer's report for 2011 and the revenue report and the bills payable report for December of 2011. Old business? No old business listed. <coughs> Discussion? Um, the first item we'll have under discussion, we're going to um, move the Presley Ridge item down a little bit. So under discussion, we'll turn the uh, podium over to Mr. Mascia, um, who will present a picture of the uh, middle school in terms of uh, student data and achievement. <coughs> thank the board for allowing me the opportunity this evening to present uh, our student data as to how our students are performing at uh, South Moreland Middle School. I would also uh, publicly like to recognize Janie Lehman for uh, helping me with the, uh, with the PowerPoint presentation. And not just because there's a large number of them standing behind me, but I would also like to, uh, <laughs> I would also like to acknowledge the hard work and dedication of the teachers, not only at the middle school, but also throughout the district, because it is really their efforts that allows me to be able to stand before you and present the data that I'm going to, so I want to thank them. Okay, about South Northern Middle School, number of students enrolled is uh, 454 students, percentage eligible for free and reduced lunch, is 49 percent and we roughly have about a special education population of 13 percent. I would like to present our sixth grade uh, math scores first. The blue on the top being our grade level scores the red is the state scores and the green is the benchmark scores. As you can see from the, the graph presented, South Moreland sixth grade middle school students are performing well above both the benchmarks and the state scores. <coughs> Looking at our reading scores, once again we'll follow the same legend with the uh, blue being South Moreland middle school students performance <coughs> scores. Uh, you can see that we are at or above both the state and the benchmark scores for uh, the reading for sixth grade. Okay, looking at our seventh grade math scores, you can see that uh, our this year's scores were 88%. Once again, looking at the legend, the uh, baseline data benchmark was 67, and the state average was uh, 79. So once again, we are scoring well above 
both the benchmark and the state data for seventh grade math. Seventh grade reading, you could see that we are once again performing better than the benchmark and we are at the state averages. <coughs> Southmoreland Middle School scored 75, the state average at this point was 76 and we are basically at slightly below the average. Looking at our eighth grade math scores, you can see that uh, they've done, they did quite well. Uh, they scored 91%. Looking at the state average of 77 and the benchmark of 67, there was a considerable difference between both the, the state and the benchmark for our students. Looking at our 8th grade reading scores, you can see that our 8th grade this year scored a 95% in overall for our reading versus the 82% that the state had scored and the 72% that was the benchmark for the state this year. Okay, our science scores. This year, uh, we scored 67% on the science PSSA test uh, versus the state's uh, score average, which was 58%. And if you take a close look at uh, this score, this, this particular graph, uh, it was a school-wide goal last year of improving writing scores. So you can see that in 2010 there was 58, score 58 percent, and this year they scored uh, 92. That is a considerable difference. Uh, that that is attributed to the, the, the great effort that everyone had uh, done in in moving uh, writing scores. And just to, for for clarification, in what Mr. Mash is showing you right now. When he says 92%, that means that 92% of the students at South Warren Middle School, eighth graders, were either proficient or advanced in writing. It wasn't 92% on the test. In, uh, in the state, 73% of eighth graders were proficient or advanced in writing. And that's what you're seeing in all of these. Yeah, as Dr. Scott said, every graph at this point it indicated those students that were proficient or advanced. Okay, the data that you're looking at is uh, PBOS data, which is the Pennsylvania Value Added Assessment System. Uh, it is an, another form of information that we, are, uh, we use to determine our progress. In this case here, basically zero is good. That's showing that the students are, show, it, it, it are showing or some growth. Uh, anything that is of positive value is obviously very good. Anything that is of negative value might be of concern, as you can see, and it's kind of difficult to see from far away. But uh, basically, the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students, sixth grade has uh, blue in this case, indicates that there has been significant progress in uh, achieving student growth. Yellow is an indicator that there is uh, growth, and obviously, red might be an area that we might be concerned about looking at. But uh, as you can see, both in the, uh, the averages and across the board in some of our yearly scores, we have uh, shown significant growth in our students' performance. This is for PSSA math. Okay, once again, this is uh, PBOS data. This is for the reading scores. And once again, the legend blue being showing significant growth throughout the course of the, the year. And as you can see, in almost every level, our students have shown significant growth 
Uh, we, we have very high achieving students and they're also showing that there is significant growth in what they're doing, performing on a yearly basis. Okay, looking at our economically disadvantaged students, these are uh, students that are scoring proficient or advanced. And as you can see, the bottom legend, the 64 and the 65 would be the state averages. And once again, we are scoring for sixth grade math well above the state. Looking at reading following the same legend, with the state being 51 and 52, once again, sophomore and middle school, sixth grade economically disadvantaged students are performing well above what the state averages are. Looking at seventh grade economically disadvantaged math scores, once again, you can see we are considerably <coughs> higher than the state averages. And I will summarize all this in a synopsis toward the end. <coughs> Seventh grade reading scores, you can see they progress from 65 to 73 through the course of three years. And once again, we are well above the state averages. Eighth grade economically disadvantaged students from math, looking at that, once again, 61 this year for the state average versus the 83% that our students have achieved. Okay, and eighth grade economically disadvantaged stu students for reading this year, we are very proud that they scored 91 versus 67 for the state. Okay, grade six advanced. This is the percentage of students in grade six that have scored advanced in math. Uh, there, I only had one reference point, uh, the 54 percent, so if you, if you are questioning as to why there is only one reference point, I only had one point of reference to include in this, but I thought it was important to show how we are uh, in comparison to the state. Once again, you can see the blue being Southmoreland, uh, sixth grade, we are well above what the state is performing as far as uh, students achieving advanced in math. Grade seven advanced in math. Once again, you can see I only had one point of reference, so uh, I could only use a comparison in there, but once again, we are well above what the state is scoring as far as seventh grade students advanced in math. Grade seven advanced in reading. Uh, we are basically at state <coughs> average the red dot being, once again, the state average and the blue being South Moreland's scores. Grade 8 advanced in math. And I don't want to be redundant in what I'm saying, but once again, you can see that we are scoring well above what the state is averaging. And grade 8 advanced in reading, 72% versus the 58 for the state for this year. So overall, our students are performing very well in, this, in the test. Okay, synopsis, a quick synopsis of what, how we perform. In math, for sixth grade, we were 25 points higher than the benchmark. 
13 points higher than the state average and four point increase from the previous year. So we have shown growth in sixth grade math. In reading, we, had, we were the same as the benchmark. We were two points higher than the state average and we remained the same as in the previous <coughs> year testing. For seventh grade, in math, we were 21 points higher than the benchmark, nine points higher than the state average, and we did have a four-point decrease from the previous year. In reading, we were four points higher than the benchmark, one point lower than the state average, and we had a three-point decrease from the previous year. For the eighth grade, we were 24 points higher than the benchmark, 14 points higher than the state average, four points increase from the previous year in math. For reading, we were 23 points higher than the benchmark, 13 points higher than the state average, and a 10 point increase from the previous year. Science, we remained the same as the previous year, and we had a nine point, we were nine points higher than the state average. Uh, writing we were particularly proud of. As you can see, there was a 34 point increase from the previous year, and we were 19 points higher than the state average. So considerable growth was done and, and was achieved in writing. And once again, that is a tribute to a school-wide effort. The implementation of our collaborative teaming at South Mullen Middle School uh, the building goal, we wanted to continue to improve reading and writing across the curriculum. Ways that we were looking at to improving writing skills and scores. Our 6th, 7th, and 8th grade language arts teachers will work with staff on how to develop writing prompts and will identify key areas for student practice. And then those writing prompts will be shared in team meetings and faculty meetings, which we are already doing. Ways that we looked at improving reading skills and scores, <clears throat> we asked ourselves some critical questions. How can we enhance the effectiveness of our collaborative teaming? Were previous SMART goals achieved, not achieved, and why and why not? We reviewed our course uh, scope and sequences and our curriculum maps. We, uh, we spent a, a considerable amount of time updating those. We identified key anchors, standards, and essential outcomes that were necessary for our students. We also identified skills, knowledge, and dispositions that students must acquire, and we wanted to verify teachers are using frequent, common, formative assessments. We also analyzed student performance on frequent, common, formative assessments. Our teachers did take the, those assessments and looked at how our students were performing skill-wise and addressed those issues. Uh, we are verifying teachers are working at a common pace. We wanted to understand the essential reading skills needed for students to be proficient. We wanted to continue to ensure the commitment and accountability on everyone's part. We have been devoting time for language arts departments to meet and collaborate. Uh, that is both across the, the elementary school and in the middle school, the fifth and sixth grade teams have been collaborating during common uh, time that they have teaming. And also uh, within our building at the middle school, our sixth, seventh, and eighth grade language arts teachers have been, we, I've been trying to devote some time for them to be able to collaborate and get together as a department. And our language arts teacher is the content expert at grade level, expert for grade level teams. So we're using them as the experts. Our second goal was to integrate meaningful reading assignments into all curricula. We have frequent reading ass ass assessments, I'm sorry, in all classes that will evaluate student comprehension of the material presented. And we have daily activity periods scheduled that will provide students the opportunity to read. Okay, ways we are implementing our SMART goals at our school. We uh, wanted to identify the types of readings. We wanted to clarify the essential reading skills. Review and identify student <coughs> skill gaps determine the criteria by which teachers can judge the level of students' understanding, 
practice applying that cr criteria consistently, develop frequent, meaningful reading assessments, look to determine if there is clear vertical articulation of the essential skills that is both within the building and with the elementary and high school, uh, both the high schools and the elementary. And uh, we're not at this point, we're slowly getting there, but we wanted the language arts teachers and grade level teams to use Moodle to interact and share ideas. Moodle is an interactive uh, form of communications where teachers can go on and interact on an informal basis electronically. <coughs> Okay, teaming at South Warren Middle School, all teachers belong to a team. Every team, every teacher in our school belongs to a team. We have grade level teams that meet three days on a six day cycle. Of those three days, one day is devoted to student concerns, one day is devoted to curriculum, one day is devoted to enrichment and uh, intervention planning, and then on two days, our, our faculty will sit down with students and go over intervention and, and enrichment strategies and also we have inclusion planning and supporting uh, inclusionary practice where our learning support teachers will actually work with our core teachers to, uh, to implement inclusionary practices within the classroom. Our specials teams, which would be all, all classes, all the teachers other than our core teachers, they meet two times on a six day cycle. They're, they address student concerns and they have, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I should have changed it. They also do uh, student engagement activities. Uh, they, I'm sorry, I, I should have changed that bottom one. Their basic function is to be involved in student engagement. <coughs> okay, interventions and enrichment levels at the middle school, i.e. intervention and enrichment time is offered two times per week. We have academic support home rooms that are based upon student classroom performance, have been established with core teachers and student mentors working with struggling students. On Tuesdays, we have after school tutoring for struggling students in math and reading. And we have a tiered level of in intervention where we have a Friday guided study session during lunch period. And we also have a Saturday session for students that need additional support. In conclusion, South Moreland Middle School recognizes that students are achieving at a high level but must ensure that students continue to show growth in both math and reading. We also want to recognize that reading achievement must improve. Reading is a focus for all students in all grade levels this year. Writing achievement is a continual focus for all students in all grade levels as it was last year. Our teams are continually reevaluating in establishing our SMART goals, and we want to use the, the current student data to make informed decisions on the best educational practices to best educate our students. So I want to thank you once again for allowing me the opportunity to share this data, and I open myself for any questions that you might have. Yes, sir. Um, the benchmark lines seem to be dramatically lower than the state lines, the state averages. Yes, they, they have been established. They, they are on an increase every year. They do increase with, uh, with next year's obviously going to be a higher. So those were established by the state. Okay, are they ever going to meet? I mean, are they ever going to say the state average is going to become the benchmark? I would think probably not. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about the PVAS? Okay, then. PBOS is, is a Pennsylvania Value Added Assessment System. Basically, that is another way that uh, the state has, has uh, given us the opportunity to look at student data and to see how our students are performing. Uh, we, they, take, uh, they take the PSSA data and they're using that to show whether or not a student is showing growth. It is quite possible that a student that has been performing at an advanced uh, level on, an, on a test. They, they are performing at a very high level of achievement, but it is quite possible that they might not be showing growth within that particular area. So the PBOS data allows us to take a snapshot at that student to see in, or a particular uh, segment of students 
to see if they are actually showing growth within particular areas. How many years are they lo losing now in that three? Uh, uh, yes, I do believe. You had yellow, green, blue, and red on there. Um, you said the blue was good. Blue is, yeah, blue is showing significant growth. Uh, more, than, more than one year significant growth. Within. And what was uh, yellow and green? Uh, yellow, I believe, is... Uh, blue. blue is that there's significant yeah. evidence that students are gaining at least one year's worth of growth. Mm -hmm. Green is that there's some evidence. Yellow is that there's limited evidence. And, and the red is there's significant evidence that students are not <coughs> Uh, getting a year's worth of growth. I was puzzled because some of them had a minus on the number. So it, zero is good, and anything above zero. So uh, maybe maybe just a, a little bit further on PVOS. Uh, so far, with, with uh, adequate yearly progress and no child left behind, we're held accountable for achievement, student achievement. And in some of these cases, you saw, for example, in eighth grade math, where 91% of our students are either proficient or advanced in math. but Technically, they might have walked in, in the door the first day of eighth grade and been proficient. You can't determine that from the achievement scores. What, so what the state did at some point, because we do have students who are not achieving for, for whatever reason, they added, and this is a kind of a, a national trend, a value added system. Wherever a student's learning level is, even your students that are below basic, can, can we show evidence that you're taking a below basic student and at the end of one year, even if they're still below basic in achievement, are they less below basic than they would have, than they were when they came into your grade? So what PVOS allows you to do is it compares cohorts to cohorts. It, it, it compares individuals within the cohort. So you can, you can track with PBOS, you can track one student from, from every grade that they're assessed, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, and eleventh grade, and you can see if they are growing, and you can make predictions on, very accurate predictions on future performance. So we even have to be willing to address the, the warts in all part of our data. And, and, and PBOS is a nice tool for allowing us to do that. There is some discussion across the nation that ultimately we can use AY, we, for example, maybe a learning support student that is struggling, well, they're not achieving at the benchmark, well, maybe we can look to see if we're adding value to that student and get adequate yearly progress that way. But some of our, our data that isn't where we want it, for example, in, in eighth grade, 91% of the students are proficient every year. It's some of the highest performing data in the Commonwealth. But when you look at four years worth of growth data, what it's saying is that those advanced kids, almost seven out of 10 kids that are, that are advanced at the end of eighth grade, well, the data is saying that they were advanced coming in and, and they should have been more advanced when they left our program. Than what, than what is showing. So once we see that data, and we, we have, in every grade level, we, we can look at PVOS data and see those kinds of things. Uh, for example, we can look at our PVOS data and see in sixth grade, we add tremendous value to our lowest level learners. But in sixth grade, we don't do it with our advanced kids. In seventh grade, we're not adding value to our low level learners but we're adding great value to our highest learners. In eighth grade, language arts, they add value across the board. So when we see that, now we have to get together and we have to start talking about what are the instructional practices that are allowing us to add value to what strategies. Do, obviously, you guys, you have four years of data that shows us with basic and below basic kids, you guys do a great job of getting them to learn. What are you doing that we can use in other grade levels across the district? And, and that's a way for us to improve. Okay, so even though we had concerns at the 11th grade level, there's enough growth from that 91% that when you measure those kids in 11th, there's still growth, right? Well, we can look at 11th grade PBOS data and to see. 
and, and I think what our that's people, been a concern. Well, and, and it still is a concern. What what you look at, unfortunately, when you look at our our data, our, and this is a statewide trend from eighth grade to eleventh grade, uh, achievement goes down. Achievement goes down, and when you look at our particular case, what we're also showing in some cases. Growth goes down. Yes, but in reading more than math, not as much as reading. And, and then it's up to us then to say, okay, what are we doing? Okay, are we focusing on that, Tim? Oh, absolutely. The change there. Yeah, and again, I, I look at it again as another tool that gives us a, a really a tremendous opportunity. And you said three years. Well, well, if you go back, well, it took us, we'll be honest, it took us two years to even understand what the heck it was. It's very complicated. And we go to a lot of trainings, and I think... At South South Florida, our teachers are using the data constantly. As administration, we finally, I think, have a really good understanding of how to, of what PBOS data is, how to use it. And for the last two years, we, we really have been using it. And it's, it's a nice opportunity. So you use the individual PBOS to look at the individual kid, but you're using the bigger ones for the school. Yeah, <laughs> I would actually say we use, as an administrator, I use the more global stuff. Right. But what I see when I go around the schools, teachers are constantly using individual PBOS right. kid right. data right. to track growth. And, and they can actually break it down to, to individual skills. Okay, but you make your goals in that out of Absolutely. that global, the global picture. I have one last question. Can you tell me about the Saturday session? Saturday session? Uh, that's a two-hour uh, Saturday morning from 9 to 11 o'clock where students that are, are really struggling uh, getting homework done uh, meeting goals in, in the classroom uh, our teachers provide them the opportunity to come in and they will work with those students that need additional support how do they get there? Uh, most generally the parents will, will bring them All there the bring yes them. have you seen that newest thing out now called flipped classrooms where no, I have not talked about What they're doing is they're, they're reversing it. They're saying you, should, you do the work with the students and the homework in school, and they go home and the lectures are given over the Yeah, actually, uh, classroom. Once, you, once you had said that, uh, Dr. Scott had indicated we, 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 we had, a we yeah, had, we had conversation conversations about. concerning that. Yeah, it is a very, it does seem like it's a novel I idea. Pittsburgh. It, it, Pittsburgh. I can't provide you the legend, Dr. Like for uh, the PBOS. No, that's okay. You know, I, I, I know about PBOS, but I don't know the real nitty gritty details of it. You know? Yeah, I'm actually, uh, I didn't want to pass out my, my presentation, but I do have the notes presentation for you, so a copy will be given to you. You all know, they will show all, the, all that data. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the kids that are struggling, last year's kids, sixth and seventh grade last year, who were a year now advanced, are you keeping track now of them this year? Like in, on an individual basis, since you know who struggling, so you're going to keep with them so that those they don't keep going. Right now, lost. Josie, in, in answer to your question, Mrs. Kaufman, our our uh, every grade level, our sixth, seventh, and eighth grade right now is intensifying their intervention strategies as to how they're going to address those students in our schools that are struggling in the in particular areas. They have broke they taken every one of their tests, they do common assessments, they've taken common assessments, broken them down by skill gaps as far as students, so we're taking a look at all that data to so try to address where those students are really underperforming, yes. That's good. And, and once again, I really have to uh, verify one thing, it's not because I, I think our, our faculty is doing an, an excellent job of addressing the students that uh, really are struggling. And also, as Dr. Scott, uh, we're taking a look at that data also to, in, in the enrichment side of it to see how we can get those students that are advanced or proficient and bring them up to the next higher level. So we're do, I, I think we're doing a great job in addressing not only those students that are struggling, but also trying to uh, enhance those students that are, that are achieving well, but we need to get them to the next higher level. I think a really interesting perspective is if you just go back 10 years, not very long ago, we didn't have any standardized achievement data like this so you know we, we really weren't held accountable and, and we, we tried to show that we were doing a good job in different ways I guess but the accountability piece you know when, when this came in around 0203 now we had an opportunity to go to teachers and say hey we're, we're being held accountable for student achievement we have to you know back in the old days when, when in, across our district when fewer than half of our kids were proficient or advanced and now we're up to nine out of ten so, you know, the teachers took on a great challenge and were very successful. 
And then PBOS comes along. And really, it's, I, I will always look at it as an opportunity. Okay, nine out of 10 kids are proficient, but did they gain a year's worth of learning in your program in seventh grade? Well, now we have a way very st that's statistically accurate to really look at that. So now we have to go to teachers again and say, hey guys, we, we told you how important it was to ensure students are achieving at a certain level. Now we, we need to also make sure that you are showing that we're adding value within that one year of learning. And we can't say, hey guys, well, we're going to forget about achievement this year and just focus on growth. We have to say we're focusing on achievement and growth. Because we don't want a kid to come into seventh grade that's already advanced and then not really do a whole lot with them. And they just sit around and we, we know what that's like. But we need to be able to have an individual prescription for that student and have data. It's all evidence-based now that we have a year's worth of growth. Teachers have taken on that challenge. And it's, it's really amazing how, obviously, the school day isn't any longer than it ever has been, but we have to work differently. I and mean, we have to be more focused. We, we, we have to be more efficient. Uh, we we kind of, just like any organization, the auto industry, we, we are streamlining ourselves to meet these future challenges. And, and it's really, it's, it's kind of neat to be part of a, a, a team in an organization that has, with the proper support, has been able to do that. And we'll continue to do it. Uh, uh, our data is very good. We do have holes in the data. Uh, nobody is more aware of it than we are. And we always constantly are looking to have a plan to address it so we can continue to get better. The district has taken such a, a view on this that every teacher in our schools have been in service on, on interpretation of PBOS data. So we, we have set down an in-service time, designated, carved out designated time in our <coughs> service to meet with the teachers to present uh, the PBOS data. They are also in team, I know that at the middle school, I can only speak for the middle school because that's the most where I'm at, but uh, I know that at the middle school our team levels are also embracing this and using that data to be a lot more prescriptive for individual students. So it, it is it is a wonderful tool and they're using it to really assist our students. Good job. I have a question. Um, I assume I know the answer since it's individualized, but maybe it's wrong or maybe there's different parts of it. Is the PBOS system open to the public to go on and look how the school is doing? You can't look at individual students, but well, the, that, what, the stuff that Vince is showing you, yeah. yes. Could, could we get that web address like on our website so that parents can get access to it because it's a great tool if people are looking to move into the community to see how great we're doing. I don't know if it's doing. on our main page, but it is on the middle school. The middle school, yeah, you Dan can Clara access. put that up a couple of years ago. But maybe it would be easier to find if it was on the main page. Yeah. So people are looking yeah. to move into our community and see how great we're doing. It's a great publicity thing. Yeah. I have one more question. Is there a standard of growth? established is it must be one year is, is one year established uh, as acceptable <coughs> or not because that's going to vary with the kid right there, what, what the PBOS looks at yeah. is all the numbers that the, yeah. that the statistical numbers is looking is, show, is dealing with one year's okay, worth of growth. Right. The standard they're using is one year. Yeah. And zero, zero equates to one, one year's year. worth of right. growth. Okay, and so anything above zero is good. Anything below zero, you're a little concerned. If it, and okay, and we're minus. always dealing with three years of data, not just that's you know, a single that's anomaly. We're looking at three right. years. Right. If it's three years, that's a pattern. How old is the PSSA now? Uh, 02, 2002. So nine years. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Masher. Yeah. 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 Just to uh, dovetail off of Mr. Mash's presentation, we received a letter uh, the day before yesterday, I believe it was. Congratulations, this is from the Department of Education. Congratulations, the Southmoreland School District has been assigned the following AYP status for 2011, made adequate yearly progress. Pennsylvania follows a single accountability system aligned with the Federal No Child Left Behind Act, 
for all public schools and districts in the Commonwealth. <coughs> the Pennsylvania Department of Education determined that the district's AYP status after reviewing the 2010-11 PSSA results, graduation rates, and attendance rates for the district. Please know that the Department of Education continues to support your efforts and the work that you do every day in helping students achieve at high levels. Thank you for your continued hard work and support of Pennsylvania students. And that's signed by Carolyn Dumaresk. Uh, she's the Deputy Secretary for Elementary and Secondary Education. That's great. The next item uh, that I have for discussion, uh, I've been in some discussions with the uh, Executive Director and the Program Director with the YMCA. We recently had a situation where one of our daycare centers in town closed, and that created a problem for a lot of our families uh, in terms of trying to find before and after school care. And I know uh, Mr. Swink and uh, Mrs. Geyer were inundated with requests to bus children uh, not only to daycares at other daycare centers within our district, but they were asking us to bus to <coughs> the middle of Mount Pleasant and several other places that we can't take buses to. So I um, did a little bit of research and discovered that uh, many YMCA's partner with schools and school districts to provide before and after school care. And the way it generally works is the school provides a space and the YMCA provides programming and staff for before and after school care. Um, so I would certainly open that for discussion, but at the, uh, at the, next, at the uh, voting meeting, we would ask you to uh, consider, consider that as well. Jason. Um, if someone gets hurt during that time, who's responsible? The YMCA for would carry that insurance unless it's uh, a, a building issue. For, you know, if, if they if would the, fall and get cut or something. Right, that would be a YMCA issue, right? Where would you put it? In one of the uh, empty classrooms at SES. At the elementary school? Yes. Okay, I have a question. Before and after school care, are you talking like 6 in the morning? Because many of those daycares start at six and yeah. end at six. We we don't have um, all those details worked out, but it would be six six thirty. Now, uh, if if this is approved, the YMCA will be sending out a survey to determine if there is a need for such a program. Uh, if if the need is there, um, they would then apply to the Department of Public Welfare to uh, get a license to to operate the program um, as as a child care center before and after school. Well, are they interested in doing it? Is someone down at the Y interested in doing it? Yes. That? Um, now, would we have to like open and close for them? Uh, would we have to staff it at six in the morning uh, and say at six at night, or would we be responsible for opening and closing the building security? The building security. Issue? Yes. So you'd have overtime for the custodians. Oh, there would not be overtime. Uh, we, we would it be staffed. Right, it would be staffed. Do you have someone here at six in the morning? Not at six in the morning. So I don't know if we're going to open at six in the morning. Um, I, I don't know. That, again, that's something that needs to be worked out, and we would certainly work out those details. When does our first person come in around 7? Lee, 6.30. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's not too much to Yeah. Do. Are we voting to she look more into it? Six. Or are we... At SES. When does it start at 6.30? we need SES. 6.30 right now. You could open up the building. Yeah. <coughs> we transport these kids. We would transport anyone who would be at the primary center yeah. from SES to the primary center or back, as, as we do now for many kids as well. Are you talking about preschool kids, Jack? No. School, all no. school age children. Yes, so this is before and after school care. So if the parents want to come in earlier, they'll have to bring them if there's not a bus. Say you had a fourth grader, they want them here at 6.30 in the morning. The parent would have to bring them. Yeah, if they come in on the bus, they don't need the care because when the bus comes, we're oh, staffed as a school. The house. If right. Going to the house, they want right. to bring the child in. Well, right. They may have to bring them. Right. They, they would have to bring them. They would have to pick them up in the evenings. Right. right. So uh, the, the only uh, responsibility that the school would have is providing a space, period. And the Y MCA would take care of the rest. Are we voting to look more into it? Are we voting to we are, like if they can work it out? We are voting to provide them a space. Um, just to give you uh, an example of what's going on here, the Greensburg YMCA, um, they run programs in 13 schools in two districts and one private school. Um, 225 students are serviced. Um, the Ligonier uh, YMCA um, services 60 students at four schools, and they also have a, a program at the YMCA. Um, 
East Suburban YMCA does five schools over two districts, and Valley Points does four schools uh, and has also has a program at their YMCA, and they're doing approximately 35 students per site. Now, does Mount Pleasant do one? They do not. Okay, and we, you're talking about the Scottsdale Y down here in town, right? Well, it's not down here in town anymore. It's up on 119. Oh, on 119. Right. They hired the personnel down to come Right, over. right. <laughs> so there's, all we're doing is, is providing a service to our parents by providing a space. Um, the YMCA would staff it and would you know, charge whatever they need to charge in order to cover their, their staffing costs. It shouldn't cost us anything much. No. It shouldn't cost us much. No. And any clearances would be the responsibility of the Y, correct? The entire program would be the responsibility of the Y. Exactly. Other questions or discussion on that? Does there seem to be interest in it on the parent, parents' part? We, we don't know, but based on, uh, Mr. Swink, the conversations you had, that there was, you know, quite a scramble when Guardian Angels closed. Um, so I'm suspect, yeah, so I'm suspecting that, that there are uh, folks who are having difficulty finding daycare. And again, they're going to send out a needs assessment. If they find there's no need for it, then you know, they won't be doing the program. But now, b before we b before we started on all that preliminary, we wanted to make sure that yes, the, the board is okay with providing a space because if the answer here is no, then there was no need to go any further. Now, see, I'm sorry. I don't yeah. see a problem. I don't either. A lot of daycares are all year round. Are we gonna let this go through the summer? This oh. is before and after school camp, mm -hmm. right? Oh, I have a question. If there's no school, they don't come, right? Correct. And again, that, that's something that we could work on. And as this e evolves, we, you know, we'd certainly provide you with details. So I'm giving you off-the-cuff answers that, that I'm assuming to be correct be as of tonight. What? When there's no school or snow day, because they're still going to need somewhere to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what, what did Guardian Angels see? They were probably open. When they they open, yeah. 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 They'd have to understand that, I think. It's or, again, we, we don't have buses on the road, so you know, yeah. it could be a... But then again, that's a detail that, that we can work out as time goes on. Jack, can you talk to some of those other schools and find out how it works for them? Absolutely. Like call Greensburg or something. Sure. Ask them if they have any problems or what they what their experience has been with it. Sure. Yeah. So we can do that. Can help us out. Absolutely. I know there was a program uh, at my former school in, in Homer City, the, uh, the uh, Indiana YMCA ran a program there, and it worked out very nicely. That was with this <coughs> That's what this is, the same yes, thing? Yes, yes. Homer Center. Right. Questions or discussion there? Okay, the next item uh, for discussion is the uh, Act 1 resolution in the preliminary budget. Uh, we'll turn the program over to Mr. Salem. Up for consideration by the board is this resolution, which is required by Act 1 of 2006, by which the board will notify the Department of Education of their intentions regarding raising the millage above the rate set by the department. If the board does not intend to raise taxes by more than the 2.4% permitted under the Act, if it does not plan to seek exceptions or put a referendum on the ballot, then it can pass this resolution and we can move on with a normal budgeting process. It's my opinion, after drafting the preliminary budget and conferring with Dr. Molnar, that we can fund the 2012-2013 school year with sufficient revenue generated by raising taxes up to or below the index and with some drawdown of the fund balance. We do not need to apply for any exceptions or put a referendum on the ballot. I'd like to reiterate that this budget is a starting point by no means is this a finished product. It is a work in progress. We have six months to increase, decrease, eliminate, and add to areas of the budget. One of the biggest pieces that has yet to be revealed is the level of funding we'll receive from the state. That information should be available in early February. I'd like to plan a finance committee meeting after that date to discuss that information and how it impacts our budget. Any questions? <laughs> um, we got this budget three days ago. It's 31 pages long and it has 1,212 entries. There were none done by category, which we had before, so I had called down and I asked Peggy if I could have a list of expenditure by function. 
So I tried to sit down and figure it out, and I, I read all of it, to figure out how this would compare with last year. I got a little way through, and then I hit a really, really serious problem. I'm talking about the single page that we got that describes revenue by function. And if, let's go down to 2400. It says administration. The amount of money there is $259,547. Last year it was $2 million. I think the numbers are just reversed. No, I don't think so, Jason. Well, you, you look on this from last year, I think he just has the numbers mixed up. Okay, if you look at 2400 from this list, and you go back to page 19, what you will see there is, it starts with nurses' salaries. Page what? 2400, the 19th page is nurses' salaries. You look at 2300, which says instructional staff, and you go back and look, and it starts with the board secretary. Then when you go to 2200, which is supposed to be people personnel, it deals with technology. Then when you go to non-public support services, it starts with guidance. Correct me if I'm wrong, I've looked at this and I can't figure it out. Because our administrative costs are like $2 million for the 2400 category. And the figure on the front page is $259,000. I, th I think the numbers are just transposed. I think the... Well, the words are too, then. Are these categories statewide? Yes. Okay, so it sounds like the categories are not matching up with the lines. So maybe. If you look last year's, I think he just has it mixed up. Well, Josie, there's one called Pupil Health that doesn't exist at all. Last year there's one called Pupil Health, and it doesn't exist at all. Pupil Personnel, 2100. Pupil Health. There's one last year that says Pupil Health. I brought it with me to get it out. But, uh, anyhow, I couldn't make any comparisons. Well, they'll correct that for us for next meeting. But we're supposed to vote on it, then. No, we're voting on the resolution that we're not going to raise taxes above 2.4 percent. Okay. Um, yeah, we're not voting on a budget tonight. Okay, if you we're read that voting budget. that we're not going to raise ta taxes past right. the 2.4. Okay, you're saying then that the budget you gave us contains a tax increase. I'm saying that the, the uh, what I'm saying is that we're not going to have we have enough money within fund balance and if we raise taxes to uh, meet next year's budget. My question then is this budget contains a tax increase. As, yes, it does. Okay, but not above the 2.4 what we're allowed. The index. Correct. But the bottom line is, if we don't want to raise taxes, we don't have to file anything. I mean, I no. certainly don't want to raise taxes. No, yes, we do. We have to file a resolution that says we're not going to raise taxes above the index. So by, by passing this resolution, you're saying, Department of Education, we're going to go somewhere between zero, and it could be zero, and the 2.4%. I'm not buying it. It says the board certifies it will not increase the school district taxes at a rate that exceeds the index as calculated at 2.4%. It does not say that we will not raise taxes. So by passing this, we are putting people on notice that this budget contains a tax increase. Well, this budget is not is not finished yet. We have six months to work on this budget. It's just like last year. You don't know that. We went and I don't know that you're not going to do it. So how do I vote? I don't vote on, on what you might raise taxes. You might you want to raise taxes, Gail, go ahead. It's okay. I don't. Say that. I don't want I don't want to. We don't but this know. says we don't uh, know anything until after we the, can uh, know. We the governor's can. So we can well, know. presentation in February. <clears throat> I have a question. Why is it here back here? Okay. I have a question. Why is it that every year we go through this? Why isn't this given to us? six or eight weeks ago to let us sit down and take a look at this so that this isn't the starting point where we have to make a vote on things. Uh, I was on the board before and we, it's the same thing. Why is, why is this given to us at the last minute all the time? 
Well, Mr. Ald, it's not given to you at the last minute because the budget does not have to be passed for another six months. The budget is passed on June the 30th. I realize that, but this is always given to us, and we're told in a week or two we have to hurry up and vote on this preliminary budget. Well, you're not voting. Why can't this stuff be given out and we have budget meetings to take a look at some of this stuff? I mean, I have a number of questions uh, that I've marked in here about this budget, this preliminary budget and some of the things that are in it that have caught my attention. I mean, a, a suggestion was made to you, Bill, that uh, we, we prepare a budget with a decrease, which I think is absolutely within the realm of possibility. And, and, and that wasn't prepared either. Why did you prepare one with an increase when, in fact, we'd like to see one without it with a decrease, uh, especially in light of the $400,000 budgetary reserve that you have? Uh, I wanted to make sure that we could make ends meet uh, under the parameters that the state's given us. That's why I prepared it this way. And I, actually, Mr. Alt, I, I did a little spreadsheet before the meeting, and, and the current budget, if I'm correct, um, does show an increase of 108, or a decrease, excuse me, of $187,000 from last year. Well, then why would you increase taxes? Well, you say you're not on taxes. We're not increasing taxes, Dr. Fike. All we're Nobody saying. Says you can. And I'm saying. You can. Doesn't mean you do. And it doesn't mean you don't. There, that, that's both sides of the coin. Yeah. Well, I agree with her. Why do you put it in there? Why do you put that in there? If you won't put in that you could possibly have a tax decrease, then why would you put in that you could possibly be voting on a tax increase? Do you want to it's the because of the, the way the statute is worded. The state, the statute the state says we have to. The state wants you to pass a resolution that says that you won't increase taxes greater than the index. So that means if you're not going to increase taxes at all, you know, you'll fall within that. But because you don't know tonight, and probably won't know for several more weeks or months, exactly whether, uh, where you will fall, um, they're not going to ask you for that degree of detail tonight. If you want to go into that degree of detail, that's up to you. But the state is requiring a resolution that um, makes it clear that you won't exceed the index. And why couldn't that be a separate proposition? Well, a separate proposition in what uh, to, to vote that, you know, we w one Let's say you voted tonight that, that you will not have a tax increase, okay? I would still say that the state wants to see the additional resolution, even though you've said that, that you will not exceed the index, because that is what is binding on you. But why does the state need to see something if we're not going to raise taxes? This is to let the state know if we because need to have someone to run the, 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 the ballot. That's the way they've stated the, um, the statute. But, Bill, did, did, I, did I hear you right say that in order to meet the budget, we would have to raise the minimum? Yeah. Because I thought that's what you said, that in order to meet this budget, <clears throat> we will have to follow through with the 2.4 is it 2.4 mil raise? That, that's this budget as it is currently written. And again, this is not the budget that we will be passing in June. This is the budget that we're going to begin work on to have the budget meetings that you've been asking for. Um, when do we vote on this preliminary budget? Next you don't. You don't. Vote on there, there's there's no, going to no, because the only way you have to have a preliminary... We're going to adopt it. The, the only way you have to adopt a preliminary budget is if you intend to seek an exception, which we're not planning to do, or if we plan to put a tax increase on the uh, a tax, a referendum for a tax increase on the ballot, which we're not going to do. So what we're saying here is Bill has prepared an, an approximate budget, and it would appear from what he has prepared that the district will not have to raise taxes more than the 2.4%. Okay, so we're, we're, we need to pass a resolution that says to the state, we're not going to 
to have a, a, a grand and glorious tax increase here, but rather we're going to, to be fiscally responsible as we've always tried to do. Now we need to give ourselves a little bit of wiggle room here with that 2.4 percent because we have no idea what Governor Corbett's going to say here uh, in, in the uh, in the February budget address. Well, can we add to this resolution and say that we do not intend to raise taxes? I think that should be a separate resolution. <coughs> Can we have one? Because I, I would like to vote on, on Mr. that. Mr. President, I cannot hear what's going on here. I'm standing right up front. Could you please take control? <laughs> Could you please be quiet back there, please? <clears throat> Any more questions on the Act 1 resolution? So my question is, yeah. can there be another resolution? Are we going to add a resolution to say that we are not going to raise taxes at this point? How can you guarantee that? Exactly. Oh, you, you work you with the budget. You can't guarantee You work with the budget to make it fair. Well, that's what they're asking you to do, to work with the budget, a preliminary budget right now. An increase. To come down, and the state wants to, that you're not going to go over the 2.4. You not you can't sit here and say you can't raise taxes at this point. Uh, we've done you that can't for guarantee six years. That. For six years, they haven't. Well, so you we know did what? The, the economy thing. and the way your state and everything's cut yeah. stuff out. How can you guarantee this? Well, can't. There are sure no guarantees can. at all. Sure, you can. We have so much in this budget that can be cut. Well, yes, that's we'll what we can do. Yeah, that's right. Well, well, yeah, but I don't want to vote on something that says we're going to give anybody the option to have a 2.4 mil increase. I, I well, honestly option. believe we need to have a, a, a decrease. You know, we're talking about what we can guarantee and what we can't. We have money to give these taxpayers a break. You know, I, I don't know why we have to have an amendment or a proposition that says we will not raise the taxes more than 2.4, Butch. Yeah, but they're not really telling you that. You can't guarantee. But it's giving them the option to. No. I don't want anybody to have that option. Mr. 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 We'll vote on that. We don't have the option to do anything because we don't vote. You vote. Exactly. Okay, so exactly. If, if, if Bill Salem comes to you in June and says, I want a 2.4% incre incre increase, Vote now. It's, it's very simple. Well, I was just going to say that. that you know, <laughs> it's very simple. Rather than debate this all night long, we'll just go through the motions here and take the vote you know, that you're going to take and let the chips <coughs> fall Excellent. where they may. Right now, we're, we need to satisfy the requirement of the Department of Ed to have a resolution that says we're not going to raise above the increase, er, it above says the we index. Can. It also says we, we're voting on a resolution that says hmm? we can yeah, increase taxes. And I can't, I can't in my heart vote for that. Perhaps. No. Any more questions? Would this be the appropriate time to ask about certain line items? No, because this, this is talking about Act One resolution for the agenda, so that would be. Because I mean, if we're voting on something that has to do with the budget, I see a lot of things in here that I've marked. I, I can't. If I, it's I, not budget. appropriate, that's. Fine. I would like to do that at a finance meeting where we we devote an entire meeting to the budget. We have now, who is on the budget committee, and when are we meeting? They're just still being put together, so we'll let you know hopefully next week. Okay, well, we'll have an answer by next week. Who's on it and when we're meeting? Well, we'll meet after the after the governor's budget address. When's that? The first we're part of February. 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 Okay. Five school districts in the month of December had already looked at their preliminary budgets, according to the Tribune Review. And what did this? What did those five districts say? Uh, they were looking. Some of them just said they're not going to raise taxes. Some said they were going to raise taxes. And some were seeking exceptions, right? Uh, a couple were some seeking exceptions. Yeah. They've done the same thing that we're going to do tonight. Sure. Well, right. No, they're seeking exceptions. They're, if they're seeking exceptions, they don't pass this resolution. Right. They pass a preliminary budget that says budget. we are going to, or that says they are going to, plan to increase taxes above the index. Okay. We're not doing that. I raised this question last time. What if we need a 25% in tax increase <coughs> and we passed this resolution? Based on the uh, numbers that we have, it would appear that we do not need a 25% no, tax increase. No, I know. Increase. I'm just saying, even if you need three, Jackie, even if you need 3%, what we're saying is that uh, 
we have a budget in front of us that contains a tax increase, and we have a resolution that says we have the option of increasing those taxes. And I, in my mind, I, I just I can't do that to people out there. The economy is just too too devastating. I can't do that. Any more discussion? Move on. All right, the uh, next item is policy 903, public participation in board meetings. Mr. Solicitor, do you have an opinion on whether or not we should be discussing this this evening? Um, I do, and it relates to the fact that uh, we've had a, uh, a case uh, at the magistrate's office, which is still subject to appeal and the appeal time hasn't run out at which the defense wanted to make some issue of these matters. And um, as a result of that, I, I don't think that it's a wise thing to be having a public discussion on it uh, until that case is uh, made final, either by the appeal having been perfected or there not being an appeal. Well, wouldn't it be a good idea to discuss it now so that we do not have the same situation where we're in front of a magistrate? You want to wait till the case is done, I think. Is what well, I know that's well, what he's saying, but I mean, if, if tonight, point, for instance, something we, happens, uh, if, if we need to clarify what we're, what we're I doing. don't know that you do need to clarify it. I mean, it may be uh, that you don't. Uh, in fact, you may be spinning your wheels over things that you don't even have to discuss. I requested this be put on because I have a concern. Tell me again. Why are the people out here talking? No, it's more than Jan. I hear a lot of people out there talking. So you want to wait to talk about this till we're done? Well, that's my recommendation. My concerns have nothing to do with the hearing, Mr. Potonic, or any anything related to that hearing. <coughs> well, the, the there was there was question on direct examination about the policy, so discussing the policy seems to have something to do with the hearing. Mm -hmm. So I can't discuss the policy. I didn't say you can't discuss it. I'm saying I'm recommending to the board that the board not to discuss it. Well, maybe we can table it to February. Whenever the How much more abuse am I going to take between now and February, Jason? Quiet, please. When will we know about the hearing? Do we have any idea? Is there a date? You, you, you can have a motion to table. Yeah. Is there a date when we'll know when the hearing and all that appeal stuff is done? Well, if, if the appeal is filed, I can inform you that it's filed, but there's a 30-day appeal period. So we would know before the end of January. So we could do it in February. So First I've meeting in February. So can we vote on it since it wasn't advertised? Part of the voting meeting? Can we talk about it in session? I'm sorry, session? what do you, what do you want to vote on? I'm, I'm can we vote on her motion to table it since it's not advertised as part of the voting meeting? Yes. What is an advertised? To Isn't it table on? this, oh. even though it's not on the agenda. Well, that's a procedural matter. You can vote on the okay. procedural matter because it's it's the, yeah. you're not going to take it up. So you made a motion table. What do we have a second? Second. I'll second. Second. So. You need a roll. You need a roll call, please. Mr. Alt. Yes. Mr. Beistel. Yes. Dr. Fike. No. Mrs. Kaufman. Yes. Mrs. Love. Yes. Mr. Polakowski? Yes. Mrs. Rhodes? Yes. Mr. Bentz? Yes. Much so Mr. Table. The next item uh, on the agenda, we received a letter uh, from the South Woman Wrestling Team. They will be wrestling in the Burgettstown Tournament on January 20th and 21st. Um, the Wrestling Parents Association would like to have the wrestlers who win Friday night and advance into the Saturday round uh, spend the night in a hotel. Hotel expenses being paid by the Parents Association. And they're also asking for a uh, bus uh, to and from the tournament with the wrestlers who do not advance 
Um, so we'll be asking you to approve that uh, at the next meeting as well. Discussion on that. Okay, the next item, uh, we received a letter from the Scottdale Public Library um, requesting uh, financial support from them. Um, what has been done in the past, uh, and I believe this started back in um, 2002, the library came to the board with a proposition that uh, they would make free library cards available to um, Southmoreland students who were not necessarily within the circulation area of the library. Specifically, that would be our Fayette County students uh, in exchange for a, uh, a monetary contribution. Um, a little bit of history there. The um, first two years, which were 2002-2003 and 2003-04, um, we uh, contributed $1,600. Uh, beginning in 2004 through the 2009-10 year, uh, the district contributed $2,000. And last year, the district contributed $10,000 uh, to the library. Um, so we would uh, open the floor to discussion on, on this matter as to uh, if and how much uh, should be contributed to the uh, Scottdale Library. Any of the grants that we're going to be getting here soon, can any of that money be allocated to the district? Does this have to come straight from the district? Well, when we uh, co contributing to the public library would not be part of the EITC approved programming, so probably not. Well, could we contribute to the levy we did uh, the sixteen hundred? Is that feasible? It's your decision. Do you have a range? Recommendation? What's recommendation? Would you like to I would say uh, no more than five, five thousand. Last year when we voted on this, there was a lot of discussion, and one of the main topics was once you establish amounts like this, it's expected that it's going to continue, or that it's going to be a lot more than we had ever done in the past. We last year we contributed five hundred percent more than we did the year before, and there was. I know, I know, Levi's not here, but I know he spoke to that and I spoke to that and so did several other people. We did that as more or less a one-time grant with the understanding that we would go back to the $2,000 level. And in the letter that I wrote to the uh, library um, when, when we sent the check, I, I did indicate um, that we were able to uh, have a more substantial contribution and uh, we weren't even sure, based on the discussion we just had five minutes ago, whether we'd be able to contribute at all or, or how much we'd be able to do in the future. So you're absolutely correct in, in your statement. Well, then what do we do? Would, would you write him a letter and tell him we just don't know? That would be up to this group. Do they? Mr. Salem suggested uh, an amount uh, less than $5,000, 5000 or less. If, if it had been customary in the past to Donate two thousand, and last year was a five hundred percent increase. And I say, let's go back to the two thousand. That's what I'm recommending. We did that for a very special reason last year. We we wanted to make sure that those kids could have those library cards, right. and and we said this that was a one-time thing. We made right. that very clear. And we did. We talked about the fact that it should go back then to the either two thousand or sixteen hundred dollar sixteen hundred dollar level. Okay, so then on the agenda for next week, we'll, we'll have a motion for a $2,000 contribution. Are we in agreement yes. there? <laughs> All right, the next item is um, PSBA report, Dr. Fike, okay, PSBA you conference. You over 911, Jack? You don't want to talk about 911 either? I think that, that was included in, in the uh, litigation as well. <coughs> I assume that the motion was. I was both referring of his to both. I was referring to both. I don't know yeah. what the resolution is. Yeah. Oh. Mm. Okay. Um, I did have uh, one other question since this is a discussion session. Um, did we not, by board action, terminate the swimming program? Yes. Well, the letter I got implied that you've restored it. No, the letter you got implied that we would like to earmark that money to restore. We haven't restored anything at this juncture. Well, you know, uh, and, and one of the reasons for that is when, when the money was awarded to us, that was something that the bank had requested that that money be earmarked for. So that would take board action to reinstate that as well. Okay. You're absolutely correct. But I'm, I'm concerned now. Are there strings on this money? Now, are we getting money and they're going to 
we're being told how to use the money. Is that what's happening? There are approved programs through the Community Foundation, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. so we have to stay within those. Um, the bank did ask that we earmark some of that money for the guy uh, That's my question. partnering with That's the guy my question. the. I, I didn't look at it as strings attached. Uh, I looked at it as a request. It was a friendly conversation. Well, the letter that I, I read implied it was a done deal, that that's going to be part of that. I would like it to be, yes. So, but again, that takes a board vote. So there are strings attached. But, I mean, it's okay. I just, I just want to be clear because that's EITC money, and I thought it was entirely up to us as to what we did with it, but apparently... No, the, the, the bank has, has always um, talked to us about, about some things they would, they would like to see. Okay, I never heard N that. Never specific. Yeah. yeah. Music and science, when, when we first started to get this money many years ago, music and science were two of the, uh, the big interests, and that's how we ended up with the MIDI lab. We did some um, water testing field trips, things of that nature. <coughs> Literacy uh, was, was, was in uh, an interest, which is when we went into the accelerated reader. Okay, my experience is not sufficient then to, to know that this has been done in the past. I saw it as, as a different thing compared to what we did before. Or you're saying that has been the way it's been. PSBA conference? Okay. Uh, I'm giving this report on attendance at the PSBA conference, which I attended on behalf of the Westmoreland IU not the South Northern School District. I have not discussed the PSBA conference because up to now I have very politely kept my mouth shut at South Moreland. Uh, at the IU, the executive director and I both attended the conference. We both reported to the board and they are the people who paid our way. Now it's my understanding that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, the South Moreland School District spent, what, about $6,000? for people to attend this conference. And of course, they paid zero for me to go. Um, there's an old saying, be careful what you wish for, you just <coughs> might get it. So this report is being presented at the specific request of Marcy Bentz, the president, uh, the board president's wife. Before I went to the conference, I did a little bit, a little bit of research on PSBA. <coughs> and I looked, I thumbed through the budget, and it appears to me that we pay about $10,000 a year to belong to it. Would that be about right? I believe so. There's a lot of other services besides just being a member of PSBA. Well, okay, but we pay, we spend about we do 10 pay a PSBA a considerable amount of money, yes. Yes, we do. And um, I don't think people know that the total annual revenue taken in by PSBA is $9,116,776, of which more than half of that is dues alone. But in addition to that, if you want to attend their conference or if you want to anything from them, like the policy manual, so forth, you pay. Um, so everybody who went to the conference uh, had to pay a, a minimum of, what, $300 a person, I think it was, to attend this conference. Right now, the um, PSBA has a, a surplus of almost $4 million, three-point-some million dollars. And one of the things that disappointed me very much, and again, I didn't want to talk about this, this workshop began on Tuesday. It was a finance workshop, and it was, it was about what, how you deal with the budget crunch, the, the cut in funding, and so forth. But if you wanted to attend that one, it was another $200. And to the best of my knowledge, nobody here attended that one, right? I, could, you, I attended that one, yes. Okay, okay, so that was another $200, okay? And in my opinion, that should have been that should have been a conference that everybody should have been eligible to go for as part of the agenda. I felt very strongly that's a, a major concern to all school board members is funding issues. But yet they made that a separate one. You had to pay another two hundred dollars. So the conference began on Wednesday morning in this large room, and um, it began with one of the most beautiful, beautiful mo moving musical um, presentations I've ever seen by the Abington uh, Senior High School Choir and String Ensemble. And uh, it was absolutely beautiful. I, I thought it was a, a wonderful way to, to begin the meeting. And that was followed by um, speeches, at, at various awards given to people, and a spelling bee. 
and we all saw the spelling bee. The opening speaker was a man named Jamie Vollmer, and uh, again, I never wanted to open my mouth. His speech, I think, came with a side order of pom-poms, but the truck didn't arrive. I saw him as an egomaniac spouting a bunch of raw-raw platitudes without a single concrete resolution to anything. Uh, he, he ab obviously has not seen the cartel because he's a national speaker, the cartel, which is, should be required viewing for every school board member. And I watched in amazement. I just couldn't figure out what planet this guy lived on. I, I thought it was absolutely stupid. I don't, I don't know how else to say it. I think the man was just blowing his own horn. The next presentation we went to was Dr. Terry Madonna, who is a pollster. Now that report's been given three times. Do you really want it again? I don't think so. But the next one that I went to was absolutely fabulous. And it was done by Dr. Christopher McGinley from the Lower Marion School District. Can you go to it? He is the superintendent of this pretty plush school district. And uh, he had what was called the Great Laptop Spy Scandal. His, he had only given this program four times, and he came out of the goodness of his heart to tell people, you better be real careful about your technology and your technology program. And let me explain to you what happened. This school district decided everybody has to have a laptop. Every kid has to have a laptop. That's got, got to go that way, okay? So what, what you don't think about is, guess what? Kids lose laptops, they break laptops, etc. okay? Well, they had a student there, and he lost not one, not two, not three, but four laptops. So the school district put in a, a program that would help them if, when this happens. <coughs> when a laptop was lost or stolen or something like that, they had a program that when the laptop was turned on, wherever it was, every 15 minutes, it would snap a picture of the person who was sitting in front of that laptop. And they could track it and find where this laptop was and see who had this laptop. Because the kid could say he lost it, and he never lost it and get a second one. So, okay. So this kid loses four laptop computers and they press the button and they take a picture of him in his bedroom at home with a drug deal going down. When it was all done, folks, the school district paid the student $175,000 for invading his privacy, $45,000 to his attorney, and it was just it, just, it, it tore this district to pieces. And this Dr. McGinley, who oversaw this, was, was he, he was a real hero, he stepped into it, but he even had to pay, I forget how many thousands of dollars for personal protection because he was being threatened. It was, it was a, a but he, the point of him telling this story is, if you have technology in your school, know what you have, know who's using it, know who's doing what with it, and be very, very careful because it is a two-edged sword. And he said they revamped their entire uh, philosophy uh, after that to make sure that um, uh, things like this would not happen again. <coughs> the second workshop I went to was on cyberbullying. And it's not cyberbullying of kids, it was cyberbullying of teachers. And the stunning statistic was that 18% of all cyberbullying against teachers is done by other teachers. The rest of it is from parents and students. They talked about, and the administration should be, I'm sure they're aware of it and they should be concerned, these kids can make up terrible things about a principal and put it online. They accused them of being drug dealers, homosexuals, uh, pedophiles. Do you know the kids won? They won them all. It comes from this little book, the Constitution, that says there's free speech. They want them all. So again, they, he, this cyberbullying thing is really, really tough. I brought in a paper today. I don't, I don't know where. I, oh, here it is. Let me tell you about the latest one. It's called cyberbaiting, a new teen trend 
to humiliate teachers. So it was a it was a wonderful workshop. It was it was stunning to me because you know I'm not I don't do this stuff, but um, I, it's something that we need to. Uh, hopefully, it has never happened here and never will happen here. But cyberbullying uh, again, they touched on what happens when the kids cyberbully each other. There have been suicides as a result of this. Um, they can you you do not have to print something true when you you can do anything you want and. We lose sight of this, and, and they talked about the devastating effect that this can have on teachers, school districts, and, and students. <coughs> so, I don't want to talk about this, but since I'm being forced to give this report, I'm going to talk about dinner that night. Quiet, to, please. To the best of my knowledge, all the school board members from the South Moreland School Districts, and I believe the administration, left the convention center and went to the high-priced Hershey Hotel where they were wined and dined with a free meal paid for by the architects that we hire and pay here. You know, this isn't my first rodeo. I made a mistake when I was on another board of doing that, and I regretted it, and that's why I chose, I, I would not do this. This is a real conflict of interest. We pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for, our, for these kinds of services. There are all these firms out there that want this business because the economy is bad. You put yourself in a position now, somebody stands there and they're saying, I want you to vote on whether I get this contract or how much money I have, and they just bought you a dinner. So I just, I thought that was a bad thing, and Mike, I believe you were there too, so. Your wife wanted to, that to be announced. Thursday morning, we had a voting session. There were 293 people. And what they did is PSBA puts out this, this agenda, and you're supposed to vote on whether <laughs> you want it or not. Um, I don't know why. It, everything, everything was just rubber stamped. So I, I can't figure that out. The voting machines didn't work. Um, what you do is they, they tell you hit a button or something and so the people behind me started screaming and carrying on and I you know I couldn't hear it but I don't even know why they bothered voting because it was just a big rubber stamp it doesn't matter then I went to two workshops that were specifically related to special ed cases because I was there for the for the IU and they they were cases that related to almost exclusively to IEP contents um, Dr. Matta attended them and what they had was a panel of people, and you'd have multiple speakers talking about multiple things. A great deal of it was about federal regulations and laws that were related to special ed. I spent a lot of my life working with this stuff, and, and I had to smile because I remember, this is a little side thing, that uh, I remember going to an IEP conference one time where the parents were demanding that the school buy the child a horse. <laughs> so it talked about what, what people can and cannot do. I did not go to any of the vendors. There, there, there was a room in the back there where they have all these vendors and I'm not buying anything. But what I did do, so I spent a considerable uh, period of time with the students that were there. These students were in a hallway. It was a hallway and they had booths that were set up on um, two sides. And a lot of it was just the raw, raw, we're wonderful, you know, and this and the other. But there were two that I thought were profound. The first one was a, a, a group of students and their, uh, their uh, chaperones or whoever. They were from a school out east and um, their principal is a, um, uh, a woman and she established a program called Youth Leaders. Did any of you stop and get that information? These kids were absolutely incredible and what this woman has done is she said look if we want our kids to grow up to be good leaders, then they better start doing something now that is positive. She has them going out in the community where they're actually physically working and helping people. She did another thing, and I'm probably the oldest person in the room, but does anybody here remember Patrol Boys? <laughs> she reestablished Patrol Boys. We don't hire cross we are Patrol Boys, okay? Uh, but she had a lot of wonderful services that these kids um, uh, were involved in. 
And I was standing there <clears throat> trying to talk to them, and they would come up and say, well, ma'am, ma'am, can, can I demonstrate? I mean, they were so assertive and so cute, and, but they were leaders. You could, you could just see that these kids were, were, were developing uh, these skills, the skills that they will need later on in life to assume leadership roles. The other one that I spent a lot of time with was the booth by the Jeanette School District. Did any of you go to that? The Jeanette School District has decided that they are going to teach in total con concept about the Holocaust. Joe Yorio is the school director from Jeanette who's on the board with me at the IU and I, I talked with Joe. But I went over and I talked to the, um, the teachers. There were two teachers and about six or eight students and they had brochures and so forth. They have actually constructed a Holocaust museum they have. They were lucky enough to get Mr. Mendler, who's a local um, Holocaust survivor from Lake Trobe. He, he died recently, but he came down and spoke. They have the woman from um, the Squirrel Hill who, who still comes out and speaks because many of these people are very old. But they didn't just teach these kids about the atrocities or Hitler or any of that. If you really study the Holocaust, it didn't happen overnight. <coughs> There was that whole era of propaganda. And Hitler's great uh, success, if you really want to get a group of people together, give them a common enemy. That'll bring them together. So he gave them the Jews. He, he, they talked about how people betrayed one another. Um, they, they talked about all those things that, that came in to getting him in power, you know, how if you want to tell a, a really good lie, want people to believe it, put one grain of truth in it, and they'll buy the whole thing. And they taught about that. And then I was able to contribute to them somewhat. I have, in fact, walked the grounds on multiple occasions of Auschwitz and Birkenau and uh, Dachau and Sachsenhausen, Sachsenhausen. And if you ever do that, it is a life-changing event. And when you go you stand on that hallowed ground and you, you come away with a, a, a new perspective on life and you learn that you don't blindly follow orders. You do question authority. You do have the right to self-defense. You do have the right to, the, to, to believe in whatever religious thing. These things become so evident to you when you realize that, that 11 million people died. Uh, my family still lives in Poland. I lost two, co two cousins in the camps and two men and two my male cousins and uh, a female cousin who was in slave labor, the uh, conscripted labor for the Germans. But it, it, it's very profound and I talked to the kids and they did invite me to come down and uh, it's in April, they're having a program, so I don't know if I'll go or not, but these kids were so respectful and so so well informed and, and their idea was they're teaching about what happens when you start to hate people, when you have hate crimes, when you have these kinds of things. Then that evening, there was a dinner there, and the speaker was a man named Bert Jacobs, who found some, founded something called the Optimist of Life. Came out on stage dressed in a knit skull cap like the prisoners wear, baggy jeans, a dirty t-shirt, an old sweater, and tennis shoes. And, and I really don't know what his message was, other than you must always wear rose-colored glasses. And that was his answer to life's problems. But the next morning, Friday morning, and I, I, I would guess that Mr. Dr. Molnar will agree with me, they saved the best for last. This. First of all, they did have the Jefferson High School marching band. If you can picture a marching band in a room this size, I mean, we were like, like this. But anyhow, that was done. And I found, we found out that they had this marching band because the new president of the PSBA came from there, so she brought her band. But anyhow, this, this speaker on Friday morning was so wonderful. And why they didn't have him on at the opening, I don't know, because people left. Uh, <coughs> His name is Salome, S-A-L-O-M-E, Thomas L, Thomas L. He's a black man from Philadelphia, and he's probably one of the most inspirational people I've ever heard in my life. There is a documentary out there called Waiting for Superman, and it talks about what is happening in the, on the national picture with public education, and everybody's waiting for Superman to swoop in and save the public education system. And his message was, you don't wait for Superman, 
you become Superman. He has refused to abandon the inner, inner belly of Philadelphia. He grew up there and he, he talked about how hard life is for those people and the schools. You know there are 244 failing schools in Pennsylvania, 114 of them are in Philadelphia. But what's interesting is Philadelphia gets 31 cents of every dollar in education, but they only have 11% of the kids. So that, that tells you there that doesn't work. But anyhow, he, he got up, grew up, got an education, and he immediately went back to that area to teach. And he, I think he wrote a book called I Will Not Abandon You. Didn't he? Did he say something like that? I think that was the name of But his whole premise is you don't abandon these, these, these kids who need your help. He talked about he would go to their homes, he would visit them, he would beg his parents, their parents, I mean, he would beg their parents to let these kids um, uh, make them come to school, try to get them to help and so forth. But he discovered something very, very interesting. He, he took these kids, he, saw, he had these kids, he was teaching, they couldn't read, couldn't write, couldn't achieve anything, failing schools, and he started to teach these kids how to play chess. And these kids who couldn't learn anything developed these incredible skills <laughs> playing chess. He, he had a, um, he has champion players nationally, state. It, it was just absolutely unbelievable. The whole community then began to back him. But he talked about community involvement and he, he made the statement the school boards must be accountable to those that they serve. He said that he has had many opportunities to move on, lots of offers for, for different jobs, positions, and so forth. But so far, he has refused to leave the very town in which he was raised because his philosophy is that he will not abandon those kids who need him so much. He joked about his wife didn't take this all so well at times. It took a, a great personal toll on him. But he just, in my mind, he was just an amazing human being that I wish they could have put on uh, at first. I felt that the whole conference was worth just hearing him and uh, also the speakers that talked about uh, the serious concerns that are related to technology, which is a, a big issue in the United States today. So if this is not sufficient, um, feel free to challenge me further. Thank you. The only thing I would challenge is they saved the best for last, present company excluded, because we had some pretty darn good presenters there from our district right. as well. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, <laughs> Dr. Fike's correct. He, he was indeed uh, an amazing guy. Um, anything else for public consumption before we move to citizens' comments and re-adjourn this meeting to personnel and then we'll come back to a special voting meeting? I just want to say I think I just read in your report that you get to go back out to Hershey to present again. Station Square. Station Square. You won a contest? Is that it, it was a competitive application to uh -huh. present on. on That's on PLCs? It's on how uh, this, uh, how the, uh, the model of collaborative teaming in this district has led to improved student Wonderful. performance. Great. Congratulations. Can I say one thing? Can I say one more thing? I got a letter, I think everybody did, from a, a student named Davis Simon. Yes. And uh, he is doing a reading project to raise money for the American Red Cross. <coughs> this is one wonderful young man. He has almost $3,000 in, in pledges, and um, I had sent him the money, and, and the Red Cross responded. I mean, it's straight down the line. But I think David Simon is to be commended for this wonderful um, project he has uh, taken on to help this worthy cause. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Citizen comments, Lori Bates. I don't think I have any. No comment? Very well, thank you. Entertain a motion to uh, adjourn this meeting to executive session with the understanding that we'll be coming back uh, to a very, uh, special voting meeting. Make a motion. Second. Voice vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Be right back. Next meet. Okay. You mean today or? We have a motion to reconvene. So moved. So. A motion to adjourn to the special voting meeting. So moved. I'm sorry, we should take a vote on so, so. take a vote for the motion to reconvene. All those in favor say aye. 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 aye.
Any opposed, say nay. Motion passes. Motion to adjourn to a special voting meeting. Second. 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 All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Passes. We don't need to do the Pledge of Allegiance again, do we? Yeah. Uh, roll call, please. <coughs> Mr. Alt. Here. Mr. Bystel. Here. Dr. Fike. Here. Mrs. Kaufman. Here. Mrs. Love. Here. Mr. Polakoski. Here. Mrs. Rhodes. Here. Mr. Betts. Here. Citizens' comments? A uh, citizen comment. We have a uh, citizen comment from uh, Mr. Jan Kiefer regarding um, public public comment at board meetings. Is that correct? Public, public policy. speaking policy. Right. Which, because you've tabled the matter, I believe is no longer relevant. Mr. President, what was it? Do you need to rule? Was he bound by our rules? Well, yes. I mean, is it doesn't. We don't. We're not. You have on your agenda to vote on Act One. I just didn't know if the citizens were bound by the same rules we were. Well, it has to be relevant to, to uh, matters that are before the board. So he should have done it during the citizens' comments when we reconvened, or before, right before the reconvene. But having said that, the solicitor has already advised us, and we've already voted that we weren't going to discuss so those from the one Act One resolution. Act 1 resolution, whereas on June 27, 2006, the Pennsylvania Legislature passed Act 1 of Special Session 2006, entitled the, Ta the Taxpayer Relief Act, here and after Act 1. And whereas Act 1 requires school districts to limit tax increases to the level set by an inflation index, unless the tax increase is approved by voters in a referendum, or the school district obtains from the Department of Education or Court of Common Pleas certain referendum exceptions. And whereas Act 1 does, however, allow a Board of School Directors to elect to adopt a resolution indicating that it will not raise the rate of any tax for the support of the public schools for the following fiscal year by more than its index, provided this resolution must be adopted no later than 110 days prior to the date of the election immediately preceding the upcoming fiscal year. And whereas the Southmoreland School District index for the 2012-2013 fiscal year is 2.4%. Whereas the Southmoreland School District Board of Directors has made the decision that it shall not raise taxes, shall not raise the rate of any tax for the support of the Southmoreland School District for the 2012-2013 year by more than its index. And now on this fifth day of January 2012, it is hereby resolved by the Southmoreland School District here and after district, Board of Directors here and after board the following. The board certifies that it will not increase any school district tax for 2012-2013 school year at a rate that exceeds the index as calculated by the Pennsylvania Department of Education, and that is 2.4%. The board certifies that it will comply with the procedures set forth in Section 687 of the Pennsylvania Public School Code, here and after School Code 24 PS 6-687 for the adoption of its proposed and final budget. The board certifies that increasing any tax at a rate less than or equal to the index will be sufficient to balance its final budget for the 2012-2013 fiscal year. The administration of the district will submit the district's information on a proposed increase in the rate of a tax levied for the support of the district to the Pennsylvania Department of Education on the uniform form prepared by the Pennsylvania Department of Education no later than five days after the board's adoption of this resolution. The administration of the district will send a copy of this resolution to the Pennsylvania Department of Education no later than five days after the board's adoption of this resolution. The board understands and agrees that by passing this resolution, it is not eligible to seek referendum exceptions under Section 333F of Act 1 and is not eligible to request approval from the voters through a referendum to increase a tax rate by more than the index as established for the 2012-2013 fiscal year. Once this resolution is passed, the administration of the district is not required to comply with the preliminary budget requirements set forth in paragraphs A and C of Section 311 of Act 1. Provided, however, the board understands and agrees that upon receipt of the information submitted by the district as set forth in paragraphs 5 and 6 above, 
the Pennsylvania Department of Education shall compare the district's proposed percentage increase in the rate of the tax with the index. Within 10 days of the receipt of this information, Pennsylvania Department of Education shall inform the district whether its proposed tax rate increase is less than or equal to the index. If the Pennsylvania Department of Education determines that the district's proposed increase in the rate of the district's tax exceeds an index, the district is subject to the preliminary budget requirements as set forth in paragraph A and C of section 311 of Act 1. We would request a, no, we would request a motion, motion, please. Motion. motion by Mrs. Kaufman, second. Second. Second by Mrs. Rhodes. Roll call, please. Question. Question, Question on the motion. 2.4% two four, two of what? Um, the current millage. <coughs> Point six nine four. We have two different ones, yeah. Right. For one, for Westmoreland, it'd be 0.0694. Right? Yes. It would be 2.4% <coughs> of whatever the Westmoreland millage is for Westmoreland County, and 2.4% of 69.4 million. 69.4 in Fayette County. And do we know if we would do that, what that would amount to in dollars and cents? Ten dollars a year, twenty dollars a year. If we had to go two point four. Mr. Salem, do you have I think it's cash? about one hundred fifty thousand dollars total. It's roughly equivalent to a million and a half. But I mean, like per household, like how much more money? Okay. Depends on how much you that, pay. Yeah, it depends on on your assessed pay a value. Lot. It's a whole lot. Okay. We're not allowed to speak once the voting starts, but I cannot support anything that even even opens the possibility to a tax increase at this time. Any more discussion? Okay. Uh, none of us do. And, and I think by us doing this, we're being fair, saying that we're not, it's going to be zero up to 2.4. And, and if we say no to this, then we're telling the public that <laughs> we're going to go up, we're going to raise our taxes. If we say no to this, we're, we're just saying that we're not going to raise it above the index. Ho hopefully zero. I mean, I think every single one of us in this room say, I mean, I don't want to pay more. And we'll, with the administration's help, we'll sit down, when you'll sit down with the finance committee, whoever that is, and we'll make sure that that doesn't happen unless the governor does something goofy. Again. <coughs> When you talk about finance committee, I'm assuming that's the board of the whole. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Have you made any, um, given any thought or made any arrangements for the public to have comments or participate in budget meetings? The, the budget, the finance committee meeting would be a public meeting. They would be allowed to speak? We have citizen comments. But that's all, just in citizen comments. They can't comment as the items are being discussed. Okay. Any more questions? None. Roll call, please. Mr. Alt? No. Mr. Beistel? Yes. Dr. Fike? No. Mrs. Kaufman? Yes. Mrs. Love? Yes. Mr. Polakowski? Yes. Mrs. Rhodes? Yes. Mr. Betts? Yes. Need a motion to adjourn to executive session for the remainder of the evening for a couple legal matters from the solicitor. It'd be about so our it. tax litigation. Motion <coughs> by Mr. Beistel. Second. Second. Second by Mrs. Rhodes. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Good night.